All right, so previously we talked about determining the probability that a single run of Karger's algorithm is going to give you the correct min cut at the end of the algorithm. Um, so we determined before that the probability of success for a single run is going to be greater than or equal to 1 over n choose 2. And the probability of failing is just the inverse of that after a single run. Probability of failing is less than or equal to 1 minus 1 over n choose 2. So just 1 minus the probability of success. But you're probably noticing that's not really that good of odds. That's, that's actually pretty bad. If we, if we only succeed one out of every n choose two times, we're going to get the wrong answer a lot of the time. So what we traditionally do with Karger's algorithm to kind of get around this is run a lot of times. We'll run a bunch of times and then pick the best min cut that we got out of any of those runs and use that as the min cut that we'll return. Obviously, it's still not perfect because there's some small probability that none of those runs that we do is going to give us the right answer, and we'll just return the smallest of a bunch of wrong answers. But in this video, we're going to kind of go through and calculate the probability of that happening. How often are we going to succeed or fail overall if we run this algorithm a bunch of times? Uh, so for starters, let's go ahead and calculate the probability that we fail for k runs. So what this means is that we're going to say the probability that we fail for k runs is the probability that we go through every single run, every single one of k runs, and none of them gives me the right answer. If even one gives me the correct min cut, then we're good, because that's the best one, and I'll just return that. So the only way that we'll see this failure case is if every single one of our uh, tests, every single one of our individual runs of this algorithm fails. So we can write that as the probability of failing a single run to the k power, because every one of those k runs has to fail. And knowing that uh, the probability of failure is 1 minus 1 over n choose 2, we can bound this with 1 minus 1 over n choose 2, all of this to the k power. And that's just the chance that every single one of the runs that we do, every single one of those k runs, is going to give us an incorrect min cut. So now before we go further with the proof, or uh, before the uh, demonstration of the probability here, there's a fact that we're going to need to know. And I know I uh, kind of wanted to get some intuition on this. Uh, myself when I first learned this. So we'll go through this and kind of just give a quick uh, explanation of why it's true. So the fact that I'm going to tell you is 1 minus x is less than or equal to e to the negative x for all x. And you might look at this and say, that's obviously true. I, I get this intuitively, and in that case you can just skip over this little section. Uh, but if not, I just kind of wanted to walk through and see why we know this is true and kind of get some get some number sense for it. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take this take this expression, take this inequality and rewrite it into something a little simpler. So if we say that x is let's let's keep it the same color. Let x be equal to negative z then 1 minus negative z is less than or equal to e to the minus minus z. And that's just the same as saying 1 plus z is less than or equal to e to the z. So seeing that these are equivalent, we can just write this equation in an easier form, which is e to the x is greater than or equal to x plus 1 for all x. And this is the same exact thing. These two are equivalent. This was just the intermediate step. Just in case you're, you're out of practice with algebra, this is just to say, no, the, these are the same. So now that we know the thing that we're going to try to prove, why is this true? Why is e to the x 
greater than or equal to x to the 1 for all x. Well, let's go ahead and draw this on a graph. So we have two lines. We have x plus 1. So we have this, so our x plus 1 line, which goes like that. And then e to the x, which we know is going to be kind of kind of a curve, something like this, but we don't exactly uh, know where, at least intuitively, I didn't. Um, but we can assert that e to the x is equal to x, to the one, x plus 1 at x equals 0. So let's go ahead and use a different color. Let's use green. So right here, these lines match. We have our e to the x and x plus 1 are the same value. But note that the slope of, actually let's let's keep a consistent note, note color, just so it doesn't get ugly too fast. The slope of e to the x is the value of e to the x, if you remember that from calculus. So at every single point on our e to the x graph, where e to the x, or where x is greater than zero, the slope of this line is going to be greater than one, which is greater than the slope of the x plus one line. So this is going to always be just a little bit in front, above, of the x plus one line when x is greater than zero. When x is less than zero, we kind of see the opposite. The slope's always going to be just a little bit less than one. So it decreases much more slowly than the x plus one line. So as a result, we get this nice curve that always is just above the x plus one line near zero and gets further and further away from x plus one the further we go from zero. Uh, so that's just kind of give you some sense of why that's true. But now let's just put that into practice. So let's, let's just get some open space and rewrite rewrite what we were saying earlier. So what we were saying earlier is that the probability of failing every single run, the probability of failing to return it after k runs is going to be less than or equal to 1 minus 1 over n choose 2 all of this to the k. So now, let's write out the facts that we know. So the first one is that little factoid we just went through, which is 1 minus x is going to be less than or equal to e to the minus x. Another thing that we can do is say that n choose 2 is equal to n times n minus 1 over 2. And this is just kind of the definition of n choose 2. And note that this is less than n squared everywhere. And you can kind of get the sense for this by looking at these numbers. n times n plus, or n minus 1 is less than n squared. And all we're doing here is dividing that in half. So it's going to be even less than less than that. Uh, so these are the two facts we're going to be using in our evaluation here. So the probability of failure is 1 minus 1 over n choose 2 to the k. Well, based on this guy, we can say that that's strictly less than 1 minus 1 over n squared to the k. So all we're doing is putting a slightly more loose bound on this. And now looking at this, you might say, this looks a lot like that 1 minus x case we were having, where x is just this chunk. It's just 1 over n squared. So we can say that. 1 minus 1 over n squared. And actually, I guess we're just rewriting the exact definition here, but let's do that because I already started writing. We can say that this is less than or equal to e to the minus 1 over n squared, all of that to the k. So all we're doing is taking this chunk, saying it's less than this chunk, which is just the first the first uh, fact that we wrote in our fact box up here. 
So that's all we're doing. We're bounding it with an even slightly more loose bound. So now, this is a pretty useful bound for, uh, for our number, but it doesn't really make sense without a k. So what kind of k would we want to pick for this? Well, let's see what happens. Let's pick a couple k's and see how each of them behaves. So for k equals n squared. So now looking at that, you might see why I picked n squared. I want to get rid of this term, and I want to get rid of this term. So by choosing k is equal to n squared, I set my probability of failing as less than or equal to e to the minus 1 over n squared to the n squared. And you might remember from your exponent rules, we can just multiply these through. So that gives us e to the minus n squared over n squared, which is just the same as e to the negative 1, or 1 over e. So that's pretty cool. That's actually a neat, uh, a neat little exercise, showing that if we choose n squared iterations of our Carger's algorithm, we have a constant probability of failing and a constant probability of succeeding. So if we choose n squared iterations, our probability doesn't even depend on how big the graph is. But let's see if we can actually do even better than that. So let's say for k equals n squared log n trials. So the additional log n trials doesn't seem like it'll be too big of a deal. Log of n is generally pretty small. So maybe that won't have a huge effect. Maybe that, maybe that doesn't really matter that much. Let's, let's see how it actually affects it. The probability of failing in this case is going to be less than or equal to e to the negative 1 over n squared to the n squared log n. Now we do our same multiplication through. We have e to the negative n squared log of n over n squared. And this time, this simplifies to this n up here, because we're multiplying this e and the log of n. So those two give us n to the negative 1, or 1 over n. So for k equals n squared log n, the probability of failing is actually less than or equal to 1 over n. And that's really cool. So using that probability of failing, we have the inverse as well. The probability of success is equal to, or is greater than or equal to, 1 minus 1 over n. So if you pick k equals n squared log n trials and run Carger's algorithm that many times, you have 1 minus 1 over n, where n is the size of your graph in vertices, probability of failing. And you can see as you get a bigger and bigger graph, your probability of success gets better and better. And so I just thought that was pretty cool, kind of seeing how as the number of trials that you do goes up, the probability of failing goes down more and more quickly. And, and so in this case, for k equals n squared log n, we actually get a pretty, uh, pretty good probability of success.